This is a reading from the Notebooks by Maria Valtorta, 1945 to 1950, January 11th, 1946. I have received a letter from my cousin, footnote 146, see note 121, very clear. Unaware as he is of the master's dicta dictations, he uses almost the same words to exhort us not to abandon ourselves quite b blindly to the Dora case, which is very mixed. And so it is that from December the 5th until today, there have been many spiritual or human voices saying the same thing. First of all, the angelic voice, then the voice of a person very much in the grace of God, then the voice of my soul, continuously, then the words of the Master calling attention to the instability of the case and its ambiguity, and to the dangers hidden therein for the work he is doing, too, with me as an instrument, and then the words of St. Peter, footnote 147, on January 4th, 1946, and a continuous whizzing of voices saying, Be careful, for your own sake, and fathers, be careful. I confess to you that I was happy to see you leave for one reason alone. What Giuseppe is saying from so far away, I mean that this would reserve to get you out of this mess. No, it's useless. All my peace has been disturbed since this situation has been in the way. In vain I try to get a hold of myself, reproaching myself in a thousand ways for my fear, which I wish to call by other names, so as to censure myself even more. In vain Jesus tries to calm me and reassure me. He and my angel reassure me precisely because there is evil in action regarding the thing which is dearest to me. Do you know that on certain nights I have had to win real battles so as not to have you called in order to scream, leave everything, leave everything, don't destroy yourself, or so as not to yield either to the desire to start shouting out my fear at home. I don't know if you have noticed all of this. I don't know if you have failed to note that on certain occasions, the most recent one was that morning when you came back from Camayore for the last time, on hearing you so sure, I had tears in my eyes. Do they speak positively about me? If it is a voice from God, I thank him for illuminating you in this regard, but I attach such minimal certainty to it that I receive no joy. For this reason I have written my impressions from time to time. I must be mistaken. I must be bad. I don't rebel against anyone's thinking this. It must be one of Jesus' aims to have me pray for that woman, the intention not to say exactly what good or evil is involved, and no one can force him to say that. Perhaps he wants the woman to be helped with prayers, not to fall into the power of the other. I don't know. I think the woman is unaware of being a prey to deceit as well, but I cannot fail to conclude that I see in this a whole insidious distraction in regard to the work Jesus is having me carry out. And once more, and more clearly than before, I also to say to you, as does Giuseppe, who from so far away perceives things the same way I do, and the other soul I questioned, be careful, be careful, put yourself in a waiting position, a position of vigilance, observe from a distance, time will provide light, that is, if God does not do so first. Today, January 11th, at 4 p.m., I clearly feel I must tell you this and remind you that Jesus has already indicated that you should not waste time and mental vigor on, on anything but what has been in your hands for almost three years. And I feel I must tell you that I have lucid, distinct impressions that both St. Peter's counsel and the Lord's orders are to make you vigilant in the face of the trap hidden in this case. It would be a real, unforgivable error if through thoughtlessness you acted as a lever or place the lever in the hands of enemies to destroy the Lord's work in the dictations and visions for which too many snares have already been laid. And once more I ask you to open and reread what refers to Giuseppe and me. It's, it's instructive, believe me. Dora is surely the most innocuous being, but even Jesus does not deny that she is unable to react and is in a very unstable position. That is what he, the Master, said, in the dictation you have, but when the other wants to use her to harm us, 
But don't you understand that even if he does not possess her forever, it suffices for him to have her just enough to make you appear to be unable to distinguish between truth and lies, so that they will laugh at you in the curias, and so on. But don't you understand that, as a result, this would bring harm to my case? <clears throat> oh, if I could have... If I could have you feel for an hour what I experience, but you won't pay attention to me, and to my infinite goodness work the miracle of not punishing you and not saying enough to punish you. After so much good, you would then really cause me the greatest pain, and after so much holy service to God, you would do him such a serious disservice that it would not go unpunished in supernatural terms. Listen to me. Don't be a child dazzled by a device with multicolored rockets. Listen to Giuseppe, too. Jesus said this. Let us make the experience of evil be of good use for good. Perhaps Jesus wants Giuseppe, an eleventh-hour worker, but loved by him to the point of wanting to save him at all costs and by all means, to be the one to help us distinguish by virtue of his knowledge of occult forces. Let us not proudly disdain this help, but use it to safeguard the Lord's work. I would like you to understand me and grasp my agony, the agony of sensing the serpent circling around to strangle the holy work, an, ag an agony bringing cries of horror to my throat, which I struggle to hold back. January 13th, 1946. I found a story in a newspaper concerning the occult and the abduction of free will committed against a poor young woman by a medium. I do not know whether the term I use, abduction of free will, is correct. The woman is definitely dominated by the desires of the medium, who makes her act with the voice and gestures of a person who died two years ago. I said to myself, I'll copy this and send it to Giuseppe, as I sent him the report on Dora, and received an exhaustive reply useful de for deciding. As I was writing on the story, my inner advisor said to me, No, it should not be sent to Giuseppe. It is not necessary. It could provoke a return, or the desire to return to medium mediumism in this man, who has just been cured of it. To speak of Dora was necessary, for it was a demonstration of how Satan can introduce himself into the higher powers. Giuseppe had to remember, examine, and progressively end up on the right path. But here it is not. The whole matter is Satan. Do not tempt him. Rather, give the page you are copying to Father Migliorini. It will be of use to him for sermons, to show that purgatory exists and involves suffering, and to confute the theories of those summoning up the dead. Do you hear? They suffer on coming, and those who come through conjuration are souls not yet free from earthly forces, that is, still burdened with sins. I would have to say that, rather than souls, demons come. But the Blessed Word has already spoken to you about this. Footnote 148. Among the passages relating to purgatory, see, for example, the entry for o October 17th in the Notebooks 1943, and the entry for January the 15th in the Notebooks 1944. Subjects should not add words to the words of their king, and he becomes silent. The good companion, so ready to provide guidance so that I will not take steps in the wrong direction, grows silent. Blessed be God. The gospel resumes. Footnote 149. We pass over more than two notebooks of handwritten pages containing 23 episodes from the third year of the public life, written between January 22nd and February 20th, 1946. January 15th, 1946. 5.30 a.m. If I don't write about my nocturnal joy, I will feel bad. Well then, went to bed at a quarter past midnight, and Marta fell asleep at once, and when she sleeps, she really sleeps. I picked up the holy relic and began to recite the usual prayer against Satan, whom I feel is very intent on circling around my house, around you and me. I then, ma I then made an act of contrition and spiritual communion, and said the prayer beginning, Here I am, beloved and good Jesus, meditating on your five wounds as well as the one on the cross, and the act of offering, as I do every night. I finished with the glorious to the holy archangels, and to the holy archangels and angels, concluding with my guardian angel. As I was saying these last words to him, 
I interrupted myself to ask, But what's your name? You must also have a name. I call you Inner Advisor, but I would like to address you with a name. He appeared to me, along my bedside, on the right, towards the foot, and immediately said with a big smile, Azariah. Azariah? Really? He smiled even more and asked, Aren't you sure? Let us together say the Veni Sancti Spiritus and seven Glorias, as I have taught you for years, in order to obtain a reply and a guidance from the Holy Spirit in every need, and then open the Bible at random. The first name you will see is mine. I said the prayer with him, and then opened the Bible. It opened before me at page 596, Second Chronicles, chapter 15. Azariah, the son of Obed. The angel, still smiling, said, And you will find the meaning of the name in the book of Tobit, in the footnotes. I rushed to the book of Tobit, and in chapter 15, at the foot of the page, found, Azariah means help from the Lord. Azariah, son of Ananias, thus means help of the Lord, son of the Lord's goodness. The angel said, That's the way it is, and smiled, looking at me gently. I observed him, tall, handsome, with dark brown hair, a, a rounded face, perfect in its lines and color, and large, gentle, very beautiful, dark brown eyes. I observed his loose robe, a straight tunic, very chaste and attractive, lacking a belt or mantle, with long sleeves and a square-shaped opening at the neck. The robe was white and silver. The background was a very slightly burnished silver. This robe's embroidery, which seemed to be a precious brocade, was a luminous white, whiter than any snow or petal ever formed, and the embroidery was a whole stream of, li of lily stems with an open calyx. They followed in a one direction, like this. <clears throat> in such a way that the angel seemed to be wrapped in an enveloping sheaf of lilies in bloom, at the neck, on the sleeves, and at the bottom were silver stripes. I said, the same clothing as on January the 4th, 1932. Footnote 150. See the closing section of Part 4 in the autobiography. And the same appearance. Yes, it is I. And if on other occasions I appear to you with the three co holy colors, it was to remind you that the guardian watches, above all, over the life of the three theological virtues in the spirit of the one he protects. I contemplated and contemplated him, pronouncing and savoring his name throughout the night of bitter sufferings and without any shadow of sleep. From now on, then, the inner advisor will be indicated by the name of Azariah, for, as he told me on saying goodbye before disappearing before my spiritual gaze, every guardian angel is an Azariah, a help from the Lord, who in special cases becomes more manifest by his order and for his glory. January 20th, 1946. As I was sewing, I mentally contemplated the moral figure of Jesus Christ. I thought that if I could have a painting of him, according to my indications, and therefore as close as possible to what, his, to what his most holy face as a man was like, I would have a phrase written underneath to represent all that Jesus of Nazareth was. I thought of, Come to me, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and it is I, do not fear. But I felt that all of this was still not what my soul wanted to indicate, the Christ. Saint Azariah spoke to me. Jesus is the compendium of the love of the three. Jesus is the compendium of what the most holy trinity and unity of God is. He is the perfection of the three, summarized in one alone. He is infinite, multiform perfection, summarized in Jesus, an abyss of perfection before whom the heavenly forces and the blessed multitudes of paradise prostrate themselves in adoration, an abyss of love that could and can be comprehended and accepted only by those who possess love. Consequently, we can here explain how the archangel, who was a benign, holy spirit, but not holy to the point of being entirely love, was able to become the spirit of evil. It is the measure of love, which one possesses in oneself, that provides the measure of one's perfection, and refractoriness to all corruption. When love is complete, 
nothing more can come in to corrupt. The molecule which does not love is an easy breach for the infiltration of the first elements which are not love, and they force, distend, invade, and submerge the good elements to the point of killing them. Lucifer had an incomplete measure of love. Self-satisfaction occupied a space in him, a space in which there could be no love, and it was the breach through which his ruinous deprivation came in. Because of it, he could not comprehend and accept Christ's love, the compendium of the infinite, single, triune love, and the fact that nowadays the heresy denying the divine humanity of the second person and making him a simple man who is good and wise is vaster may be readily explained with this key, lack of love in the human heart, incapacity for love, poverty in the possession of love. Observe, soul of mine, that in both the time of Christ and your era, there have always been two points concerning which man's arrogant intellect, which cannot believe unless it is humble and loving, has been most obstinate, that Christ was God and man, performing exclusively spiritual actions because of which he was hated even by those closest to him, and thus betrayed, and that he created the sacrament of love, then, now, and always, the loveless heretically said, and will say that God cannot be in Jesus, and that Jesus cannot be in the most holy, adorable Eucharist. Accordingly, soul of mine, if you were to have words written under the portrait of the God-man, you should have this written, I am the compendium of love. And Saint Azariah, Azariah grew silent in adoration. What peace! What peace in me! What light! And what a feeling of mental well-being, of thought being calmed by a reply convincing it entirely, were produced during and after the angelical lesson. With my treasure, I closed the notebook and went back to manual work while my contented mind contemplated the lesson received. I later reread, meditated, and concentrated on the phrase Lucifer, not wholly to the point of being entirely love. With my sublime idea of the angels, I was unable to grasp how a spirit like the spirit that is an angel could have committed faults. I have always, I had always been invincibly astonished at the angel's sin, and no one had ever offered me an explanation as to how spiritual beings created by the perfect will of God in a creation lacking the element of evil, which still had not taken shape, contemplating eternal perfection, and that alone had been able to sin. Now the phrase, not wholly to the point of being entirely love, halted me, again prompting my, how could this be so? St. Azariah said to me, the angels are superior to men. I say, men, to refer to all the beings designated in this way, composed of matter and spirit. We are, then, superior, entirely spirit. But remember that when grace lives in man and the blood of the mystical body, whose head is the Christ, circulates, while the seven sacraments confirm him from birth to death, in every state and every stage of life, we then see the Lord in you, living temples of the Lord, and worship him in you, and you are then superior to us. You are other Christs, and have what is called the bread of angels. But bread is for men alone, a mystical, insatiable hunger for the Eucharist which is in you, and makes us cling to you when you feed on it, to perceive the divine fragrance of this perfect food. But, to go back to the initial point, I tell you that in the angels, different from you in nature and perfection, there is free will, as in you. God has created nothing as a slave. At the origin, at the origin there was only order in the creation, but order does not exclude freedom. Rather, in order there is perfect freedom, nor is there in order fear as a constraint of an invasion, an intrusion, or, or the anarchy of other wills which may produce secret pacts and ruins penetrating into the orbit and trajectory of other beings or created things. The whole universe was like that before Lucifer abused his freedom and by his own will introduced the disorder of passions into himself to create disorder in the universe. If he had been entirely love, 
he would have had no room in himself for anything that was not love. He, instead, had room for pride, which might be termed the disorder of the intellect. Could God have impeded this event? He could have. But why violate the free will of the very handsome, intelligent archangel? Wouldn't he, the most just, then, have introduced disorder into his orderly thought by no longer willing what he had previously willed, that is, the archangel's freedom? God did not oppress the disturbed spirit by violently making it impossible for him to sin. His not sinning would then have lacked any merit. For us, too, it was necessary to be able to will the good in order to go on deserving to enjoy the vision of God, infinite blessedness. God, since he had wanted the sublime archangel to be at his side in the first operations of creation and wanted him to be aware of the future, of the creation of love, so he wanted him to be aware of the adorable and painful necessity which his sin would impose upon God. The incarnation and death of a God to counterbalance the ruin of sin which would be created if Lucifer did not overcome pride in himself. Love could only speak this language. The first annihilation of God is in this act of wanting to induce the proud one gently almost begging him with the vision of what his pride would impose upon God, not to sin, so as to lead others to sin. It was an act of love. Lucifer, already turned into a devil, took it to be fear, weakness, and offense, a declaration of war, and he waged war against the perfect one by saying, You are? I too am. You made what you made through me. There is no God. And if there is a God, I am. I worship myself. I hate you. I refuse to recognize one who is unable to overcome me as my Lord. You should not have created me so perfect if you did not want rivals. Now I am, and I am against you. De me, defeat me if you can, but I do not fear you. I too will create, and because of me, your creation will tremble, for I will shake I will shake it like a bit of cloud seized by the winds because I hate you and want to destroy what is yours to create what will be mine over the ruins. I do not know or recognize any other power except myself, and I will no longer worship. I will no longer worship anyone but myself. Truly, in the creation, in the whole creation, down to the very depths, there was then a horrendous convulsion out of dread at the sacrilegious words, a convulsion the likes of which will not be seen at the end of the creation, and from it there, were, there arose hell, the realm of hatred. Soul of mine, do you understand how evil arose from free will, respected as such by God, of one who was not entirely love, and believe that upon every sin committed since then there stands this judgment. Here love does not exist entirely. Complete love forbids sinning, and without effort. Whoever loves does not labor to reach justice. Love takes him high, above all mire and danger, and purifies him minute by minute of the barely perceptible imperfections which are still present in the final degree of consummate holiness. In that state, wherein the spirit is so advanced that it is truly a king, already united by spiritual marriage to its Lord, God gives and reveals himself to such a point to his blessed Son, who enjoys only a single degree less than that than what the life of the blessed in heaven is. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. January 21st, 1946. Jesus says, Thirty-three days ago I said to you, I will, give you no, I will give nothing more until I see that everything has been set in order, as prudence requires. And I told you so in such a way that you're, you preferred to have me repeat it in a clear dictation, not only to you, but to the one guiding you. And eight days later, when the occasion arose, I satisfied you. A footnote 151, December 25th, 1945. Now everything is in order, copied and corrected, as should be done. I again repeat that in such a serious matter, and with such an exhausted instrument, it is right and proper not to let the work accumulate, but it should be copied progressively and progressively corrected, so that incomplete parts 
will not remain in the events of death, in the event of death or anything else. Never abuse trust, which is no longer prudence. Act as if every hour were the last, and always work through your backlog in all respects. And let this also be borne in mind in making provision for remaining close to the instrument until everything is completed. The painful experiences of autumn 1944 branded the spokesman who says, I cannot trust others, and if I were to remain alone, I would no longer hand over a single word. But these painful experiences have not been hers alone. You, Romualdo, have had them as well. You have also seen the actions performed, and even though you have suffered much less on this account, for Maria's sufferings, ha, Maria's suffering has been very profound, to the point of engraving an indelible sign even on her body, you have to understand that this event must not be repeated. If it is, I will approve Maria's desire and will not, depriving her of the joy of seeing, I will deprive all of you of the joy of receiving, for I will not have her write a word any longer. I cannot allow this work to be turned into a jest, or almost a jest, or remain a manuscript not typewritten and corrected. We are dealing with an obtuse, evil world, even if it is an ecclesiastical world, a world which is not interested in reviewing in order to approve, perceiving me in the work, but which, but which with its full attention would vivisect the work to find a word which, because of either the spokesman's uncertain handwriting or a mistake in copying, might appear to be a theological or even merely historical error. This is the truth, and I make provision so that hostility will be left disappointed. In these thirty-three days I have provided only two gospel visions, and I offered them because I wanted to speak through them to you, Romualdo, as I do so often. These gospel scenes of mine are lessons, lessons for individual daily life, too, and in individual cases, if they were not such, I would not have provided intermittent scenes at the beginning of the visions, as I have done, but would have started from the first word in the four gospels and continued in order. I instead furnished the episodes necessary for those specific moments to support the spokesman in the great cross she had to bear shortly thereafter, January to March 1944. In the one she was bearing, May to October of 1944, footnote 152, in terms of chronological accuracy, one of the two references to 1944 ought to be corrected. Either the former should be changed in 1945 or the latter to 1943 and to evangelize Giuseppe B., struggling with Satan to prepare him for the dictation which separated him, uh, separated him forever from Satan and from his heresies. Afterwards, when the two aforementioned needs had been met in regular and orderly fashion, I carried on the reconstruction of the gospel. But I very often speak to you, Romualdo, thereby or through the dictations I provide which are not connected with the gospel. All of them are offered to give you guidance and light, and accordingly to help you. I gave you the last two in an extraordinary manner, for I did not want to furnish anything until all that had previously been given was in order. Now remember and reflect that as I have remained silent for th now, as I have remained silent for thirty-three days, I could be silent forever, and I would do so if she, if the enterprise encountered obstacles which could harm the work. You see that Maria can do nothing on her own, neither see nor say. If as a test you said to her, repeat the last vision too, you would see that not only the words be lacking, but the description of the event would be deficient and impoverished. When taken away from my light, Maria is just another poor woman. In her there remains only the spiritual meaning, which increases her will to act in holy fashion in all things, according to the instruction received but her intelligence does not benefit from what she has seen. Once the vision is over, it is no longer repeatable by her mind. If I, out of prudence, because there was no longer a way to conserve what she writes in print, were to stop asking her for descriptions of what she sees and hears, you would no longer receive a word. This daughter would still and always be in my arms, but all the others would be left without additional lessons. Reflect and cause this matter to be reflected upon. And now, a lesson entirely for you, servant dear to me, and it is not a reproach, do not take it to be one. It is a caress by one who loves you and does not want ingenuously false or useless steps in you. 
you would not regard it as bad if a good father said to you, Give me your hand, and I will guide you along the bumpy path. Or, Do you see, my son, this flower, this berry is not good. It seems to be, but it's not. Never taste them, then. They contain harmful fluids. Just the same, in you, immortal child, there must not be pain, because I instruct you on something. You belong to my array, the array of those lacking malice, who at heart are defenseless against the crafty world, and Satan, extremely crafty in his works. It is a glory, but it is also a continuous danger, and I give special help to these defenseless ones precisely because they are such, so that they will not be deceived by lying appearances. You must not measure the supernatural entirely in one way. The supernatural is everything which lies beyond the natural world. Isn't that so? But in the supernatural, the extra-natural, there are two currents, two rivers, the one coming from God and the one coming from the enemy of God. Phenomena, when taken externally and superficially, are almost identical, for Satan is able to simulate God with the perfection of evil. But one sign of those who are mine is the deep peace and the order found in the phenomena and communicating themselves to those who are present. Another sign is the incrementing of the natural faculties of intelligence and memory, for the heavenly supernatural is always grace, and grace augments man's natural faculties too, so as to be remembered exactly in its manifestations. In the phenomena which are not mine, on the other hand, there is always an effusion of something which disturbs or diminishes the habitual supernatural seriousness by prompting curiosity, that sense of breezy, empty interest you get when you go to a show at a theater, a show with jugglers and the like. In phenomena which are not mine, there is always disorder. After the crackling of blinding rockets, there is smoke and mist, taking away the purity of the previously existing light, and you have thus seen and heard, but afterwards cannot remember anything with complete precision, and fall into contradictions, even unwillingly. Satan, with his long nailed hand, stirs and stirs to deride and exhaust. Finally, a very exact sign appears in subjects themselves. The action of a being always corresponds to my actions in a being. Let me explain. When I instruct, everything is changed in the one instructed. There enters into him a, ze a zealous hurry to do what I say, and not in slow phases of elevation, as observed in ordinary desires to be sanctified, rather in swift but enduring movements. The soul rises and changes from what it was into what I want it to be. These are the souls seized by good will. It grinds them and destroys all that was past, all that was the previous self, and recomposes them in the new form, according to my model. They are the tireless artificers of their immortal selves. They see they are changing for the better, but they are never content with the degree of goodness attained, and work to arrive at greater perfection, not because of their pride, but out of love for me. In the souls that, in a contrary sense, are false con contemplatives and false instruments, this untiring metamorphosis is lacking. In that case, as followers of Satan, they feed on and delight in what they have. And sometimes, at the beginning, they really received a gift from me. They cradle themselves in the pride of being something, and this something grows day by day, like an overfed animal. Indeed, it, it overfeeds on pride, which Satan silently and abundantly showers around them. This something gets big, big and monstrous. Yes, monstrous. It is a monster because it loses its primitive appearance, mine, and takes on a satanic appearance. They put on a halo of false lights. They exploit more or less relative celebrity to crown themselves, and they contemplate themselves. They say, I am taken care of, I have now gotten there, and they go blind that way to the point where they cannot see what they are, and they go deaf that way to the point where they cannot distinguish the different voices speaking in them. Mine is so different from Satan's, but they no longer hear it, and as I withdraw, Satan gives them what they want, forms of vanity, and they array themselves with these. What can God do with these people desirous of evil, who prefer an iridescent robe, illuminations, and applause to the cross, nakedness, 
thorns, concealment, and assiduous word, assiduous work within and around themselves in goodness and for their own and others' good, what should God do with these mountain banks of sanctity entirely caught up in idle stories and lies? God withdraws. He abandons them to the father of deceit and darkness, and they take pleasure in the gifts Satan gives them as a reward for their action. They profess to be saints because they see they succeed in matters which are extra-natural. They do not know that they are born of their pride, which Satan feeds, and they do not improve, you know, they do not. Even if they apparently do not regress, it is clear to even the most superficial that they do not improve. Romualdo, be careful with the multicolored glistening which dissolves into mist. I always leave light and concrete, orderly, clear elements. Watch out for the false saints, who are more injurious to my triumph than all the open sinners. The holy supernatural exists. I inspire it. It should be accepted and believed, but let every jar upon which there is written oil of supernatural wisdom not be accepted at first sight. Or every closed book upon which there is written, God is here, be sure that a hellish stench does not emerge from the former, and heretical formulas do not emerge from the latter. Also observe the outside of the vase and the book, where and how it likes to remain, to use figurative language. Observe whether it is humble on being approached, and active to an extreme degree in terms of holiness. If you see that its evolution towards goodness is slow, or entirely lacking, open your eyes. Open them twice if you see in this soul pleasure at being noticed. Open them three, ten, or seventy times if you find it to be proud and deceitful. Peace be with you, Romualdo Maria. Peace be with you, Maria.